Good morning. Let me start with a question. Now this might be a bit hard via a pre-recorded talk, but please can I get a show of hands to see who's heard of Q? Fantastic. Almost everyone. Whether you're just starting out on your Q journey, or are already using Q day-to-day in production systems, a frequently asked question is, where do I get started? Perhaps you're unsure how to integrate Q into your setup without disrupting existing configurations. Or perhaps the tooling layer confuses you. Or perhaps you're unclear what patterns will work best for your project and configuration structure. My name is Paul Jolly. I work on the core Q team. Today I'm joined by Marcel van Lohausen, the creator of Q. We are going to present a practical guide to Q with patterns and techniques to help drive Q adoption in your project, company, or environment. For those of you who are new to Q, we will start with a brief primer and refresher on the language and components of Q, then move on to explain and demonstrate how a simple Kubernetes and gRPC-based project would gradually adopt Q. Marcel, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, hi, I'm Marcel von Lohausen. Um, it's great to be back here at Config Management Camp at FOSDEM. Um, I would have loved to see you all again in person, but let's hope uh, things will be better next year. So I recently left Google to work on Q full time. So Q is the result from my experience at Google and before, which includes uh, being on the founding Borg team, uh, which was the inspiration for Kubernetes. Uh, so there I developed the orchestration tooling and BCL, uh, but also the Go team and uh, also my experience in applied natural language uh, processing for before I joined Google. So in total, this is about uh, 20 years of related experience. So what is Q? So Q is a configuration data and validation language uh, combined with a rich set of tooling and APIs uh, built on top of a logic programming engine. Um, so even though Q was developed in the context of Google, which deals with very large configurations, uh, we've observed that the same problems come back at much smaller scales. And because Q is relatively simple, we think it's also very suitable for such uh, smaller projects. Um, so one can explain Q in terms of various anal analogies. So one I like in particular is that Q is like a strongly typed uh, JSON-based spreadsheet where uh, nodes in the trees can be values, constraints, or even simple formulas, uh, where complex computations are handled by calls to functions implemented outside of Q, uh, keeping complex comp computation outside of the DSL. So as this will be relevant for demos later on, let's do a quick intro to the uh, QDSL for those that are not familiar with it. So first most, the Q is a superset of JSON. So here we see that Q can be used as a human-friendly JSON with a convenient syntactic sugar. So the idiom idiomatic Q on the left is completely equivalent to the JSON, or also Q, since Q is a superset on the right-hand side. Um, but Q goes beyond JSON um, and also allows specifying types. So on the left-hand side, you see a Q um, definition that's equivalent to the Go struct on the right-hand side. So what you may notice here is that the syntax of the Q in this case is pretty much identical to that of the previous uh, data-only example. So this is not a coincidence. In Q, types are just values. So in Q, string values are always quoted. Um, so the string int and bool that you see referenced here are references to an internal type. But Q goes even further than that. Also constraints are just values. So on this slide you see for population um, that it requires a number that must be strictly greater than 1 million. So this example also shows you can freely combine data, uh, data types and constraints within a single struct. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see the JSON schema equivalent of this queue on the left-hand side. What you can also see is that the queue is uh, considerably more con uh, compact. So queue is even more compact because um, the JSON schema on the right-hand side doesn't include the object name. So the equivalent queue would really be only three lines for this JSON schema. Um, so the fact that queue is so much more compact is really a consequence of treating types, constraints, and values as one of the same thing. So treating values and types as the same thing has the additional benefit that we can now properly define an ordering on entire configurations. So here we see the previous examples ordered from less to more specific. So now let's take a step back from the DSL. 
So what these examples have shown is that Q can not only handle uh, types or schemas, but really the whole spectrum of configuration related, related aspects. Um, so it also handles uh, policy, abstract types, APIs, meta policy, and even templates. Um, but there's another important property of Q uh, to make this all work. So in practice, configuration is really cross-cutting in nature. So in this slide, you see an example of how these different aspects may combine in practice. So what it's trying to show is that a policy, for instance, can be used to either validate some data or to put constraints uh, on a type or API. So even worse in practice, um, the responsibility to specify these different aspects may naturally lay with very different departments within an organization or even across companies or organizations. Um, and within a company, for example, can be split among engineering, SRE, or legal, or even different departments. Um, and also the combination of these aspects may, might be quite arbitrary um, in, in practice. So this problem is really quite nicely depicted in the logo of Config Management Camp. So I think this uh, depicts exactly what's going on, namely that everything is intertwined and you know things can be cyclical too. Uh, this logo is really quite brilliant and uh, kudos to whoever came up with it. Uh, but back to Q. Um, so not only does Q allow encoding all these aspects of configuration, so its logic programming underpinnings also make it possible to combine such, as such aspects in arbitrary order in a deterministic uh, manner. So we call this composition. Um, so how does Q achieve this? Well, really, its core operation of combining aspects is associative, commutative, and idempotent, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying that order doesn't matter, and that no matter in what order you combine these different aspects, the result will always be the same. So this is in contrast, for example, to using overrides or inheritance to combine aspects, which do not have this property. Um, and anybody who tried to implement combining data policy and schema from different sources will understand the significance of this and the underlying problem it solves. So to conclude the question, what is Q? Um, it may be clear now that Q is more than just a DSL. At its core, it's a logic programming engine um, of which the DSL is just one interface. There's also a rich API. Um, as well as modules that makes Q interoperable with things like JSON, YAML, Protobuf, OpenAPI, what have you. And because Q can operate at so many different levels, uh, there are quite a wide variety of use cases. Here we see a few examples of what we've encountered in the wild. So if you find other use cases for Q, we would love to, to hear about them. Um, so we'll now get to the practical part of this talk. Uh, and for that, I hand you over to Paul. Uh, Paul? Thanks, Marcel. As we explained earlier, the main goal of today's talk is to present a practical guide to Q with patterns and techniques to help drive Q adoption in your project, company, or environment. In the demonstration that follows, we imagine what such an adoption path might look like using a simple Kubernetes and gRPC-based project, showing how and where to gradually adopt Q. If you already use Q, hopefully this demo will give you further inspiration, ideas, and patterns. If you are new to Q, fear not. While some of the details might pass you by today, you will end up with a strong grasp of what is possible with Q, keen to learn more. Before we get into the detail of our demo, please be sure to follow us on Twitter via the Q underscore Lang handle. We'll be sharing a link to a working version of the demo that you can try for yourself locally. The code and readme will also be annotated with style tips and pointers to further reading. Now, let's look at an overview of our demo. We've tried to make our example representative of a very cut-down real-world scenario. Our company is Acme.com. Acme.com is a Go shop that uses Kubernetes to manage their deployment environment. Acme.com comprises multiple teams. Their entire system, it's very small, is composed of two fictional services, each a Go program, Quote Server and Fun Quota. Fun Quota is incredibly simple and for now does not expose any API. Every 10 seconds, as a test, FunQuota requests a number of quotes from QuoteServer and logs the famous and recognizable proverbs to stand it out. The quote package imported by both QuoteServer and FunQuota defines a gRPC-based quota service with a single method quote. The infra team are responsible for the upkeep of the system. We will hear more from them later. For the sake of keeping the example simple, Acme.com keep all their code in a single or mono repository 
But just to be clear, this is absolutely not a requirement. Now let's take a look at the running system. This demo uses K3D, a wrapper to K3S. We have a cluster up and running and a local registry that contains Docker images for quote server and fun quota. We start at the root of the repository. Again, to keep things simple, Acme.com have opted to keep all their code in a single Go module. Looking at the project structure, we can see the quote, quote server, and fun quota packages. The quote server and fun quota packages also contain the Kubernetes declarations and Docker file for each service. Our system is already running, which we confirm via kubectl get pods. Now to see fun quota in action, we tail the logs of the single fun quota pod. For now, we are only requesting a single quote from quote server, and quote server is hard coded to return this well known Go proverb. Now, the fun quota team have been keeping up with the latest trends and have heard about Q. They are keen to try and adopt Q in their workflow, but a strict requirement for now is they want to continue maintaining YAML files. So, where do they start? A good place to start is to use Q to validate those existing YAML Kubernetes declarations and to do so incrementally. Q's compositional model will allow the team to start with basic constraints, adding more validation bit by bit. The fun quota team start by declaring some basic constraints that describe the structure of their service. They do so within a file called schema.q in the fun quota directory. The package declaration is optional, but it is used later. The team declare an object to be a deployment or service using a disjunction. For those familiar with Kubernetes declarations, deployment and service objects are identifiable by the kind field. We refer to the kind field as a discriminator. It determines whether an object is a deployment or a service. For those familiar with Q, note that the team are not writing definitions. They don't yet have a schema for all the fields, they only have an incomplete definition. Similarly, they could have written one big declaration for deployment and service. But presented this way, you can see how easy it is to group related rules together. Looking in more detail at the constraints. The team enforce the use of the Acme image registry for all their deployments by constraining the image field to match the regular expression shown. For any service declaration, the team constrain the metadata name to be consistent with the app label and the spec selector app. For deployments, the team use a value alias, uppercase X, to access the top-level metadata field without having to define it. They then constrain the metadata name to be consistent with the spec template metadata label, app. Q's compositional model allow the team to break down their configuration into important pieces piecemeal, gradually refining their definitions to be more specific. Note all of this work is entirely independent of the quote server and other teams. Not only that, the workflow of editing YAML files remains untouched. Let's see this in action. In the fun quota directory, we use qvet to validate the Kubernetes configuration using the constraints we just saw in schema.q. We use the minus D flag to specify an expression that selects the schema to apply to non-q files. In this case, we want to vet cube.yaml against object. qvet processes the stream of YAML the object schema matches YAML objects by the kind field and applies the relevant constraints. Thankfully, the team's configuration passes. Let's make a change to cube.yaml to show how Q complains if the team's constraint on the use of the company image registry is violated. Now, vet the YAML once again. Q complains that the specified image is now outside of the bound of the regular expression constraint we declared. Let's undo the change and rerun vet to confirm we leave fun quota in a good state. Finally, we confirm there are no changes to apply to the fun quota resource. Paul just showed how one team created some validation rules for their own use. But sharing is caring, so I will now show you two common methods of sharing rules in Q. 
In order to explain these two methods, let us first look at the directory layout of our example. Each of our example servers is located in its own directory uh, directly under some root directory of the organization. In addition, we see a directory called mon under infrastructure, which is owned by a team that provides monitoring services to other teams. The first method of sharing that queue supports is through imports. Most of you will be familiar with this kind of mechanism from other programming and configuration languages. I call this the pull method as developers writing configuration need to decide and explicitly import a package to pull in stuff from elsewhere. In queue, all files are organized within the queue module, which is a directory tree with a certain organization. A queue mod directory marks the root of such a queue module. For those familiar with Go, this is very similar to using a Go mod file, but know that this is now a directory and not a file. The queue mod directory is a little bit like the .git directory and can be, can be used by queue to track all kinds of stuff. Once a module is established, each package can be addressed by a URL uh, relative to the module root, optionally also including the package name if it differs from the directory name. In most of our examples, files were labeled as package cube, which doesn't correspond to any of the directories um, in, our, in our example. So that's why you see some occurrences of colon cube in the import paths. A cube file is marked as belonging to a certain package by adding a package clause at the top. And all files with the same package name are automatically merged uh, together using Q's composition. The unique package path can be used to import that package. For example, if the monitoring team defines some definitions that the fund quoter team wants to use, they can use those by using the import directive uh, importing that package. So that's what you see here in yellow. Q also allows imports outside of the module root. Uh, external imports are managed within the QMod directory, but this is outside of the scope of this talk. Let us look at some code. Here we see an example of the kind of things the monitoring team could provide. The first entry says that a deployment should have Prometheus scraping turned on by default. Teams will have to explicitly disable it to turn it off. The second aspect specifies that a deployment must have a liveness probe at a predetermined path. This can be handy, for instance, if an org uses a common application framework that standardizes on these things. There are a few things to note here. We have two entries for deployment. This is really composition and action. Q will automatically combine these together. We saw this also in earlier slides that Paul presented. To re-emphasize, in general, we think it's a good style to split such rules into aspects of related functionality rather than having one big blob per type. This enhances readability and makes it easier to refactor code. Another style point here is that we split the paths to put the boilerplate path on the first line and the more meaningful part of the path on the second line. So on the first line, we can immediately see the type of object it applies to, whereas on the second line, we can quickly scan to see the essence of what the rule is doing. So the fun quarter team can now pull in these definitions by importing them and mixing them in with their own definition of deployment. But Q also has another sharing mechanism that conforms more to the cross-cutting nature of configuration. For example, suppose the monitoring team wanted to enforce the constraints we showed before as a matter of policy, rather than relying on each team pulling them in explicitly through an import. In Q, a package actually spans across the entire Q module hierarchy. So a package doesn't only consist on the files with the same package name in one directory, but also of the files labeled with the same package name in all of its ancestor directories within the queue module. Another way of saying this is that constraints labeled with a certain package name apply to all queue files with the same package name in all of its descendants or directories, and the directory itself, of course. This is analogous to how ACLs on directories work. So basically, this allows policies and constraints to be pushed across an organization by putting them in the right directory. And again, this is all made possible by the compositional model of Q. Because order doesn't matter, one can easily inject definitions deterministically. Of course, this is a very uh, opinionated model. And if there's any other push models that people would like to see uh, or like to use, we would love to hear about it. To use the push model, all we need to do is apply the same change we did before, but now at a higher level directory so that it spans different packages across the organization. So this is really the same change as the fun quoter team made earlier, with the main difference being that now these constraints are added outside of the control of the teams of the relevant subdirectories, meaning that the same constraints we had before 
now function as policy rather than as a template. Paul will now demonstrate the effect of adding these constraints to the existing configurations. On the left hand side, we can see the YAML file which declares the fund quota service and deployment. In the fund quota directory, we can use QExport to see the result of evaluating the cube package and cube.yaml. We pass the minus minus out flag to indicate we want the result rendered as YAML. Compare the existing cube.yaml file on the left with the queue evaluation result on the right. The liveness probe automatically gets added because of the policy declared by the monitoring team. Note, this doesn't enforce that it is implemented, of course. That has to be dealt with at other locations. So far we've shown how to manually verify Kubernetes YAML files with the queue command line tool. We now want to automate that process with the tooling layer, a declarative workflow mechanism supported by Q. The tooling layer was originally created to deal with the issue of injecting dynamic information into configuration while observing the strict separation between configuration and computation that's often desirable. For this demo, the goal is to create higher level commands that validate the YAML files as a byproduct, rather than having to do this explicitly. There are various ways to accomplish what we were about to show in this demo, so this demo is not supposed to be prescriptive, but rather serves to highlight the possibilities. The goal here is to write a single workflow capturing common functionality that can be used and possibly tailored by all teams. The first step for our control flow is to load the YAML files. We plan to have native support for having YAML and JSON files included into packages directly, but for now we have to resort to this. A queue workflow consists of tasks. Tasks are queue values that tell queue what action to take, describing inputs and outputs. All tasks are defined in the tool package directory. A task gets triggered when all its input fields are specified, writing the result to its output fields. Queue automatically determines dependencies between tasks based on references between them. So if a task references the output of another task, it's automatically run after it. Here we see two different types of tasks. The first task, glob yaml, finds all yaml files in the current directory. The comprehension then creates a file read task for each yaml file, each identifiable by a different path, in this case open colon file name. The tasks you see here are global tasks, meaning that they're not associated with a specific command. More on that later. Here you see the definitions of the tasks used in the previous example. On the left hand is glob, specifying the glob pattern as its input and defining the field to which to write the result, here are files, and what the type will be, a list of strings. The read task takes a file name and defines that it will set its contents to the content field. Q also allows the user to set the output field of the task to define, for instance, the desired type or to cause it to automatically validate whatever is returned. After the tasks are run, we need to do something with the file contents. Rather than reading them directly from the tasks, we will push the parse file contents into a map called object by kind, which organizes the objects by kind and name. The references to service and deployment here are references to the same types we defined before. The next step is to actually pull the task results and put them in the map we just showed. We do that by means of this comprehension. Note that we previously already parsed the YAML contents. If any of the YAML files was incorrectly formatted, that error will be carried over in this map. We adopt a convention that all data fields are camel case, so we converted the kind names here using the string to camel built-in, which is a standard library built-in that calls a Go implementation. As most commands that we will define need a list of all these objects, we create one ahead of time here as well. The final step is to define the commands themselves. Commands define which tasks are run when a user invokes the command with the queue tool. On this slide, you see the commands used in the upcoming demo. In this case, each command has only one task that's unique to itself, but they can have many tasks in reality. In fact, also these commands here consist of many tasks already, because as you can see, they reference this all object, which in turn references the task we saw before. And since queue runs all dependent tasks as part of the workflow, these are run as well. Paul will now demonstrate these commands in action. Running queue command print gives us a JSON stream of all objects. 
Now let's use the apply command to kubectl apply the result of the queue evaluation. That is the combined result of YAML and queue constraints. As expected, there is a change to apply here, specifically the liveness probe we saw earlier in the result of queue export. Let's demonstrate that validation checks are still applied when tool commands are run, by again breaking our image registry constraint. Run apply once again. As expected, a validation failure. Let's revert that back and verify that apply has no effect. So far, the Fun Quota team have been declaring their own constraints, enforcing consistency, and templating their Kubernetes service. But surely the team don't have to declare the entire service and deployment schemas by hand. Is there not a source of truth they can refer to and use that to validate their YAML? For Kubernetes, the source of truth is GoCode. Q natively supports importing and exporting data and schema for multiple encodings. We currently support JSON, YAML, OpenAPI, protocol buffers, JSON schema, and Go, and have plans to support many more. Indeed, please ensure we have open issues for encodings that you consider a priority. That helps to make transparent the priority, as others can leave emoji in support of the proposal. The Fun Quota team want to validate the correctness of their service by mixing in the Kubernetes types imported from GoCode. They do that by further constraining the service and deployment fields by the imported definitions, again within the root of the repository. These definitions in the Kubernetes packages are the result of the import from GoCode. We plan to have a curated repository of those templates, but for now we can generate them. Let's see how that works. Note that with the change shown on the previous slide, Q command apply no longer works. The acme.com x Q module does not know how to resolve the Kubernetes packages. We fix that by importing those definitions from Go code. First step is to add a Go dependency on the relevant Kubernetes packages. Then we can generate the Q definitions from the Go types. Q command apply should now work again. Not only that, but we can see that despite us now also validating against the full imported schema, there is no change in the resulting configuration. Let's verify that the constraints of the imported Kubernetes definitions correctly validate typos in our configuration. Here we intentionally mistype replicas as replica, singular. Try to apply the result, Sure enough, a validation error as expected. Replica is not a valid field in this part of the schema. Let's again revert the change and verify that we have a working configuration via command apply. At this point, the Fun Quota team are convinced. They want to go all in and maintain Q files instead of YAML. Certain language and syntax decisions in Q make that an excellent choice compared to either JSON or YAML not least because you can leave behind the world of white space significance. Q also has optional braces, optional commas, order irrelevance, string interpolation, references, disjunctions, default values, comprehensions, templates, packages, modules, etc. The language tooling is also very powerful. QFUMPT automatically formats Q code, and a work in progress language server protocol implementation will bring everything from code completion to validation in editor. Not only that, as we will see, Qtrim allows you to automatically reduce boilerplate in Q configurations, something we also plan to support in JSON and YAML. We start by importing the existing YAML Kubernetes declarations to Q using Qimport. The minus P flag adds the resulting Q to the Q package, like all of our other Q code. The minus L flag defines the path at which the imported YAML is placed. It can appear multiple times. Each imported fun quota object needs to be placed at the path object by kind, a field defined by the kind of the object for which we alter the casing using strings.toCaml, and finally a field defined by the metadata name of the object. Let's look at the result of directly importing YAML to Q. 
Here we can see the path that results for the fun quota service object. We can simplify the resulting queue using queue trim, removing boilerplate that is implied by other constraints and schemas. Watch the queue file on the left shrink in size. Now verify we can still command apply. Significantly, there are no changes to be applied, which validates that our import from YAML to queue and boilerplate removal with trim didn't add or remove anything. At this stage, the YAML and queue are living side by side, and both need to be consistent. Changing the YAML alone and running command apply results in a validation error. But given the FunQuota team now want to migrate away from YAML, they can simply remove this file and maintain the queue file. Again, no changes to apply. At this point, the fun quota service has been fully converted from YAML to queue. The team can validate their configuration against the Kubernetes source of truth definitions and have removed unnecessary boilerplate that is implied by constraints elsewhere. In the process, the resulting configuration has changed in only one respect from the original configuration namely the monitoring team's policy enforcing a liveness probe. So far, we have seen how Q helped the FunQuota team manage the configuration of their Kubernetes service, mixing in policy from the monitoring team. But this is just one example of how Q can be used. We now move on to talk about how teams can use Q to share validation logic. As we mentioned earlier, the fun quota team have hard coded the number of quotes they request from quote server at one. We saw this working in the introduction to our demo. To celebrate the fact they have converted their service to queue, they decide to increase this number to four. They redeploy their service using queue command apply and there's a problem. They start getting errors from quote server. This is less than ideal because the errors are happening live in production. We have downtime and need to roll back. The error message says that three is the maximum number of quotes that can be requested. How could the fun quota team have known this? Better communication with the quote server team would be one way, but we can't ever automatically verify a value this way. What's worse, this logic is hard coded in the quote server code. Let's show how Q can be used to help the two teams automatically synchronize on this validation logic. The quote server team own the validation that defines the limit on the number of quotes that can be requested. It is this validation that needs to be exposed to the fun quota team. Let's remind ourselves of the acme.com package structure. As we explained earlier, the quote package imported by both quote server and fun quota defines a gRPC based quota service with a single method quote. The protocol buffer definitions act as the source of truth for Go code in the quote package. The quote server team start by creating the quote queue package, using queue import to import the quota service from protocol buffer definitions to queue. Protocol buffers is another encoding that queue understands. The quote server team then create their own queue package that imports the quote package. In their package, the quote server team create a constraint that validates the number of quotes requested. This constraint can now be used by the quote server go code to validate each incoming gRPC request. But it can also be imported and used by the fun quota team to validate their service configuration in which the number of quotes to request is passed to the fun quota service as a flag argument in the Kubernetes configuration. Now the quote server and fun quota teams automatically synchronize on the validation logic for a valid number of quotes. We don't have time to show this today, but full details can be found in the working version of the demo that you can try locally. We will tweet a link from the Q underscore Lang Twitter handle. So in conclusion, today we have shown you the power of composition and have hopefully given you a good feel for how it affects design and practice. We have also shown how composition allows for a gradual adoption of Q with constraints and templating that seamlessly integrate with existing installations. We have shown the benefits of a type configuration language that unifies the concept of types and values, combining the specification of schema and data. Q is not just a DSL, but a full spectrum solution from language to tooling and APIs. We believe that adopting Q will make your project more resilient, catching problems early, preventing outages, improving coordination and communication between teams, 
and improving quality of life and making things a delight in general. Not only that, we hope to have inspired you to consider adopting Q in your project and that we equipped you with the patterns and techniques to help drive that adoption. Q is not limited to use within a Kubernetes setting. It lends itself very well to the cross-cutting nature of cloud configuration in general. The aspect-oriented techniques we have shown today can be applied in a wide variety of situations in projects of all sizes and complexity. We're hearing about new examples all the time and would love to hear about your ideas and use cases. Q is an open source project cleanly forked from Google back in June 2021 with the full support of Google's open source program office. The project has over 4,000 combined GitHub stars. We have plans to put the open source project in a foundation, something we discussed in detail at a town hall last October. The main focus for Q today is to get to a stable V1, which will give those using Q the confidence of a backwards compatibility guarantee. On the roadmap for V1, we are aware of some key areas that need attention, including package management, documentation, performance, error handling, edit tooling, and support for different encodings. How can you help? We very much welcome and support new contributors, but one of the best and easiest ways to contribute is to use Q and tell us where things go wrong or where Q could do better. Raise issues for problems that you find and start discussions. Thank you to those people who have done so already, engaging with us to help identify problems and feature requests. The Q community is a wonderfully welcoming place with some fantastic people contributing time and resources to help others on their Q journey. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation today and look forward to sharing some exciting news regarding the Q project in the very near future. We're happy to answer any questions you may have in the live Q&A that follows. Otherwise, please follow us on Twitter, get in touch via DM, or via GitHub issue or discussion link from the qlang.org homepage. Thank you and hope to see you around in our community.